All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we figured we'd we'd uh, take advantage of uh, a nice midwinter regatta in Miami held last weekend and uh, do a little debriefing. Um, and we thought we'd open it up to uh, to everyone, not just the, the the folks that went to the regatta. Um, I tell you what, it was it was pretty tough to watch uh, all that great sailing that looked to be happening down in in uh, Miami. Uh, last weekend, uh, it was it was cold up north, and it looked like the wind was great down south. And they got a lot of races in, and it was uh, beautiful Miami sailing. Um, I'm Will Wells. I'm uh, the J24 class leader, and uh, I'm going to uh, run this uh, debrief. Uh, really excited to uh, uh, you know to have um, the sailors here. Uh, you know, Nick Turney's been uh, sailing J20s forever. Um, been top of the leaderboard um, many, many times. Same with Paul Abdullah. And uh, we're, we're lucky to be joined with uh, John Mollicone as well, um, the, the winning uh, skipper from the midwinters last weekend. Uh, so th thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for uh, joining us. Um, and just a little plug for the G24 class. Uh, if you're not a member or you haven't uh, signed up yet this year, please do. Uh, class is uh, strong. It needs your support to keep it going, and uh, uh, it, it, it's it's a good thing. So, all right. Uh, one 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 thing before we get going here. Uh, questions. You know, we love questions. Uh, please put them into the questions box. Uh, we'll try to get through as many of them as we can, and uh, anything that we don't get uh, to. Uh, we will follow up afterwards via email, uh, et cetera. So uh, please keep that in mind. All right, so uh, um, race day one uh, looked to be uh, pretty light, uh, six to 10. Uh, looks like uh, this, the, the team uh, that won uh, didn't do much uh, rig tension changing. It uh, looks like they, they changed it. Uh, they stayed at base all day. Um, question for you, John. Um, you know, m must have been, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of transitioning, uh, light air, uh, crew in and out, um, et cetera, et cetera, uh, hiking in the puffs, a lot of back and forth. Um, it's, it's a really, uh, uh, hard, uh, way, you know, hard time to sail the J24 in that light air where it's, you know, a little underpowered and then, uh, into the breeze and hiking hard keeping the boat flat so you don't go sideways. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about how you uh, you went into the day and how you set your boat up? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Um, yeah, the first day was, was uh, those of you that, anybody that did the Worlds in Miami uh, a couple of years ago, it was very similar to the first two days of the Worlds. Um, I, I had some PTSD the first day of the regatta was so similar and, and really trying conditions, um, similar direction, similar sea state. Um, you know, I think we were sort of, uh, you know, our game plan was to kind of get left when we could and get under Key Biscayne. We thought that there was, um, you know, a little bit more pressure there and also a little bit more left shift with the pressure. So that was sort of our ultimate goal in terms of um, what we were thinking tactically and in terms of boat setup. You know, it was like a five to eight knot day, I'd say, for the most part. Um, and, you know, definitely streaky, you know, puffy. There were some big holes. And I think, um, you know, anytime it's sort of in that range, you know, you know, you're going to be probably at that 2015 setting. We made sure we were in our aft uh, mass butt position. And, you know, we set up um, our aft mass butt position with the North Sails. We usually look for um minus three fingers on the head stay or so you know right around there um about two and a quarter two and a half inches of pre-bend in the mast at 2015 and um you know just um making sure the boat felt powered up you know especially in the walls i think even if we were a little maybe felt a little bit too loose on the rig and the pops we were okay with that we wanted to be really set up for the walls and it was a little bit choppy out and especially when you get you know, a lot of boats around each other, you know, there's a lot more chop that that's on the race course that you might see when you're just going up wind at the beginning of the day or whatever. So, you know, looking for max power, um, you know, overall, I think, um, I always like to have a little bit of weather helm in those light conditions. You know, I'm always looking for helm. 
Um, I'm always looking to sail with a pretty consistent angle of heel. Um, and you know, with, with it being puffy and with there being lulls, there were times where everybody was hiking and there were times where, um, you know, it was maybe one person down below and then maybe one or two crew leaning in. So, you know, a lot of transitioning, a lot of in and out and keeping that consistent angle of heel and maybe even a little bit more heel in the real white spots to be really powered up, give the boat a little bit more helm. Um, and then when we get pressure, we'd sail flatter, we trim harder. Uh, but Paul Abdullah, our trimmer, he did a he does a really good job of just being, you know, I think flexible as the trimmer in and out all the time. And he's kind of our guy who, you know, if we, we're stuck in a lull, he'll go down below and trim from down below. We get pressure, he'll come up, he'll lean, you know, outside the companion way and lean out. And then if it's full hike, he'll go right up to the rail and hike. So he's really good at doing that as a trimmer. And so he was kind of our number one person you know, I think controlling the, the angle of heel. Um, and then if we needed a second person doing that, you know, usually our tactician, Mike Marshall will be the next guy and maybe he'd go in and down below if we needed him to with his head up. Um, but he was kind of the next guy. And then Nick and Dan Bora are two forward guys. They would probably be the last two to like, you know, whether come down below or, or come way in. So they were also our two lightest people on the boat, but, you know, consistent angle of heel, a little bit extra, extra heel in the walls, um, every time we got a puff and we could say trim in a little bit harder, um, I would go for, you know, super hard main trim. It was that kind of day. I think probably in the, the seven, eight, knot puffs, I'd trim the main almost two handed really hard. Um, and, uh, you know, could go maybe two to three inches off the spreader tip with the Genoa, but, you know, in the, the sort of, you know, wider conditions, we we're probably sailing, you know, four to six inches off the spreader tip, main sheet eased a little bit, traveler up almost all the way, not all the way up, but, but maybe a car width down. And, um, you know, because we set up with our mass butt aft and we had a lot of head stay sag, even in that light choppy condition, I think when you get enough sag, you sometimes still need a tiny bit of back stay on just to keep the head stay from bouncing around in that chop. And we were, we always had a little bit on, and then in the pulse, we might pull even a little bit more on. So, you know, that's kind of how we were set up. Um, you know, it was a really, you know, really up and down day and we were playing our sails a lot and weight was in and out a lot. And our, you know, I, I give, I give my team a lot of credit. They did a really good job just making sure their weight was always in the right position and working the boat really hard. Good, good. Uh, one, one question for you. Um, what about you do anything different with the crew weight fore and aft in the boat in a lighter day like that? Yeah. I, you know, our weight was definitely more on the forward side. Um, you know, maybe Nick or, or Paul might remember better where we kind of had, you know, like starting with Dan in the front, how far forward he was, but uh, you know, our weight was definitely more on the forward side. Hey, Will, good. if I could add to that, I know as a trimmer, uh, it's, it's sometimes real easy just to go sit on the low side by the winch. And I'm a, a big firm believer that as soon as I come off the rail, my weight has to go forward uh, of the cockpit. I stand in the companion way. Uh, and then if I need to go even lower, I'll go down on the low side. But as soon as I come off the rail, I like to move forward and not down by that lowered winch. I can literally look at the boats around me when their trimmers sit low by that winch. We start eating them up. And uh, it, it's, uh, I, I preach it to everybody when they ask where to sit. And, and that's, what, you know, one light air tip that I would say. Yeah. It seems to me in light air, the, the big thing is, is just, you know, not oversheeting the sails and, and not trying to point uh, and, and pinch too much. You got to keep the, the, the boat going through the water is, is, is usually the key and, and getting used to, you know, that, that feel of, of, of being flat in the boat uh, maybe flatter than you'd like to in the light air, um, but just get comfortable with that. I think that's probably the key. Well, well, nice, nice job on, uh, on day, day one, um, sliding to day two. Um, you know, this looked to be, I mean, look, looking at your rig settings, uh, there are a lot of adjustments. So it was, it was probably a pretty dynamic day. Um, wind up and down, a lot, a lot of rig adjustments. Um, you know, how do you decide, you know, to go up, go down? Do you do a half step? Um, you know, what do you look at? You, do you feel something in the helm? Do you look at the head stay sag, the, you know, the, the depth of the main, uh, lure shrouds? Um, 
you know, what, what, what can you tell us, John? Where, where do you start and how do you, how do you decide, you know, where to go on the rig on a yeah, day like think, today? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it was a pretty windy day. Um, you know, we, we, we knew leaving the dock, it was going to be, you know, possibly, you know, top end of the Genoa, it may be into the blade based on the forecast. So I think even before we left the dock, you know, good forecast, you know, what your eyes tell you as well, just looking out there and seeing full white caps, we knew we wanted to kick the mass butt forward before we even, we even got out there. So we went forward a half an inch to start. Um, and, uh, you know, sailing a boat, I haven't sailed before. So we didn't want to, we didn't want to go make it too big of a jump, but we knew we needed to go forward some, especially since on the, on the first day it was light and we did have, you know, a pretty good amount of head stay sag and, um, you know, the main was setting up, I think, you know, more on the flatter side as well. So I think we knew we needed to go forward on the butt, uh, older boat as well. So typically an older boat, you probably want to go forward as soon as you're full hiking. And so we went out that way. We started, um, we went up wind when we got out there, it was pretty windy. It was, you know, certainly we were all talking on board, whether we should, you know, go to the blade or not. And, and probably half the fleet or more had the blade up and, and the other, you know, half or, or just less, less than half the boats had the Genoa. So, you know, those are always hard decisions. And, you know, we went out, we decided we were going to stick with the Genoa. We were going to be all the way up on the rig. So for us, that's 2931. We were sort of max, you know, max tension, um, you know, felt like when we went upwind in our sort of uh, pre-race upwind, you know, practice we did that, um, we were able to go up wind without the main flogging. You know, that was one big indicator to stay probably with the Genoa. It was super choppy. So having that extra power with the Genoa, we thought was nice, that extra drive. Um, and then also what our, what our nearest competition was going to do. And I think, you know, we noticed that um, a lot of the boats we were racing with were staying with the Genoa. So we, we felt like we kind of needed to, you know, it, it, all the boxes were checked off to stay with it. I think if we went upwind and we felt that, you know, the main was flogging a lot and we had a ton of backstay on and, and still the main wasn't working and it just felt like there was too much helm and the boat was out of balance, we probably would have gone to the blade, but we, we didn't, we didn't really notice that, you know, we sailed really sheeted out. And I think one thing I noticed with a lot of boats is a lot of people tend to sail with their Genoa trim too hard. And, and I used to have that problem myself for a long time of wanting to trim in tighter and you actually, you know, your, your, uh, your height mode is worse when you trim harder and breeze, you know, you actually point higher by staying more sheeted out. I actually learned this from watching Will and breeze for a lot of years. And he would sail like a foot off the spreader tip and breeze top end of the Genoa. And, you know, we sailed that way on that day to start, you know, I'd say the first two races, we were eight inches to a foot off the spreader tip. We moved the lead forward so that we didn't lose the top of the Genoa. And, you know, the boat just felt good. It felt like it, we were on our feet. We weren't overpowered. The, the bow felt free. Um, and, you know, I never cleat the main sheet in those kind of conditions. I would say sort of any kind of top end of the Genoa kind of overpowering or even blade conditions, I tend to never cleat the main sheet. And I'm able to, you know, we vang sheet. Nick, we did a great job just getting a lot of vang on and easing it off in the walls and just playing the main sheet the whole time. And Paul and I would work together with Genoa trim and main trim and being in sync and, you know, keeping the boat balanced and on its feet, never letting it heal too much in the puffs. Maybe in the walls, we'd trim everything in harder and maybe come in to like, you know, five, six inches off the spreader tip and trim main harder. But I tend to play the main like a dinghy out there in those kind of conditions. I never cleaned it. My hands were, were killing me at the end of each day because I'm just playing the main the whole time. And yeah, if I find it, I find like a, you know, a little bit of a break and the breeze is pretty steady for a little bit and I can trim it in and cleat it for 30 seconds or a minute. Great. But for the most part, I'm playing it the whole time. And then backstay, same deal. Every wall, Paul would be like, you know, don't forget about your backstay. I'd ease backstay off in the walls, power up, get a little more head stay sag. Um, and then as soon as a puff hit again, backstay on, playing the main sheet, playing the Genoa sheet a little bit and just keeping the boat, you know, consistent angle of heel tracking through the water well and not letting it go sideways in the puffs yeah yeah that's key the you know what the upper end of the genoa the key is keeping the boat flat at the you know at a constant angle of heel so you can you know keep the boat under control you heal too much you're not you know, you end up going sideways so 
constant angle heel, any, any, you know, any possible way you, you can do that. And usually that is easing the sheets. So that's a, that's a, that's a big thing with the J24 and the hull shape and how it's set up with the sail plan. Um, so, so I got a question for Nick. I know Nick does a lot of the rig tuning um, on the boats and uh, you know, I see, you know, mass butt forward, you know, it up around the Genoa, it's a big step forward. What, um, you know, what, why'd you guys do that? And, and, you know, what, what was your reasoning there? And, uh, you know, did you test it before you went out sailing that day? How'd you end up there? Give us a little uh, rundown on that. Yeah. So the mass boat on the J24 is actually a pretty powerful tool and it does a lot of things for you on the J24. Um, with this boat that we sailed last weekend at the midwinters, um, as a team, we've never sailed this boat before. And so we didn't really have our defined settings. So we were kind of flying by the seat of our pants a little bit. And um, so that morning, you know, we kind of agreed just from past experiences sailing J24s that we wanted to move the butt forward and, um, you know, go down below We look at our holes and see where we can. And half inch was the next hole forward. So I said, oh, let's try that. So we, um, you know, moved the butt forward at the dock. I checked the head stay. And so with the butt forward half an inch, the head stay does get tighter because the top of the mast moves aft. So we went from three fingers on the head stay to a tight two fingers on the head stay. And then the next thing you want to check is your pre-bend. As you move the butt forward, the mast is going to get straighter. You don't have that compression on the back of the mast at the deck level. And so what you're looking for with the butt forward is about two inches of pre-bend, maybe a little, slightly, a little bit more than two inches on some boats, but two inches is a good starting point there. And um, so what the mass butt forward allows you to do, you can see in this photo here, is it allows you to sail with a tighter head stay. So top end of the Genoa conditions, you want a tight head stay. So it helps to flatten that head sail out and depower the Genoa a little bit more. But it also having the straighter mass makes the mainsail a little bit fuller so you have a wider range to go through with your backstay adjustments and your sail trim controls. If you had the butt aft, you have a looser head stay. If you pull backstay on, the mainsail is going to flatten out really quick. And then you're going to lose a little bit of punch or power out of the mainsail. And in the choppy conditions that Miami provides, you don't want to do that. You still want to have a little bit of depth or power in the mainsail. But you can really pull the backstay on hard and still not invert the mainsail. You can also see in this photo here, our backstay is about 50%. So we still got a good range to go through in backstay adjustment. You know, if we went out sailing and we move the butt forward and the mainsail is still inverting, we'd probably consider moving the butt forward, forward a little bit more so that we don't have that issue of inverting the mainsail so much. You know, and when we talk about day three's conditions, it's kind of more of the same. Yeah, I think, you know, not, not everyone's set up to move the mass, but um, it, it is a nice feature. Uh, it's worth putting the time in uh, uh, to make it work easily in your boat with an adjuster and maybe some uh, uh, mylar or something like that underneath the mass, butt to help it slide easy and, and have proper holes and stuff. It, it's a nice adjustment. It definitely takes some, some extra work to get used to it and, and have it work in your matrix, but it, it allows you to keep the rig set, you know, the shroud settings uh, at the same uh, tension, uh, but push the mass butt forward and, um, you know, pull more back stay on and keep your head stay tighter. It's just a nice adjustment. If, if you're not set up to move the mass butt forward, sometimes you can pull on a little bit more lower, uh, another turn and a half, depending on, excuse me, a half turn or a full turn, depending on what uh, turnbuckles you have. So that's another way to go about it. But uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, moving the mass butt um, and uh, it seems to work. It's kind of a nice, better general overall uh, setup. Um, and I think, you know, it sounds like, you know, this boat was older, uh, older mast. And uh, sometimes with, with, with those features, you have to be a little bit more aggressive with uh, going, going a little tighter on the shrouds than you normally would with a newer mast or a newer boat. Uh, and, and moving that mass butt forward kind of can help with the whole program. So that's, uh, that's good stuff. So hey, will uh, move. Yep. Hey, will just don't forget when we dial that rig up, we also want to start tightening up those uh, legs of the backstay as well. So we have that, that purchase. Yeah. Do you have a, a mode for that, Paul? Do you, do you have like a set amount of turns you go up each setting or down depending on where you're going? 
you know, I actually don't have anything written down, but it's, uh, you know, I have turnbuckles in the back. So when we go up, uh, I probably put three halves or four halves, you know, three halves every time I go up. And then when we go to that top rig setting, you know, I want the backstay to be firm. Uh, so we have a lot of, you know, a lot of purchase in that backstay adjustment because we want to keep that head stay tight. Good. Thanks for adding that, Paul. Um, moving on to day three. Uh, looked like, you know, maybe a little lighter, but still windy. Uh, looks like you stayed tight on the rig and mass butt forward. Uh, and, uh, you know, it looks like you're mostly hiking pretty hard here. Um, weights maybe a little bit further back. Uh, Nick, can you kind of talk us through your setup here? Yeah, so day three was very similar to day two, um, but with the exception of bigger lulls. You know, it seemed like the puffs were still high in the high teens, but the lulls were dipping down to the you know, 10 to 13 knot range. And so we wanted to have enough power in the rig to get us through the lulls, but we also wanted to have enough rig tension to get us through the puffs. So we decided to set up at 2724. And uh, from there, you know, it was a little loose for the puffs, but it was nice in the lulls. So what we did is we just went up one and one on the upper and the lower. And that seemed to be a pretty good kind of in-between setting. And, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, we have the North Sales Published Tuning Guide and it's really good, it's a great reference. But, you know, we don't talk about these half steps that are available to you. And it kind of depends on the boat you're sailing, the age of the boat, the age of the rig. Um, but, you know, in this case, we were trying to set up for the lulls, um, kind of get, manage to get us through the puffs. So this in-between setting was, was really good. And how we kind of found that is we're looking at our, our mainsail setup, really. You know, when we were at 27, 24 and going up wind and kind of getting into max backstay, we had some pretty big inversion wrinkles in the mainsail and the bottom draft stripe was really flat. So we didn't have a range with the backstay. It was either all the way on or off the mainsail was still pretty flat and you saw some pretty significant overbend wrinkles. So going up that one and one helped control the mainsail depth a little bit more and made the backstay a little more active. Um, you know, one thing too, talking about the conditions and setting up for the lulls is you have some sail trim controls that are available to you like Boomvang, Cunningham. You know, the Boomvang is easily adjusted from the rail, but the Cunningham is not so easily adjusted from the rail. And so in the photo here, you see some overbend wrinkles down low. That's because we have a lot of boom vang on. The boom vang will bend that lower mass section, help flatten that lower section of the mainsail. But when we are coming into a lull, you know, we're communicating this on board saying we have a big lull. The lull is going to last about 30 seconds, lull in five seconds. I'm going to ease that vang to help power the mainsail up. And if we had a lot of Cunningham on to pull those wrinkles off, we'd have to move inboard and let the Cunningham off. So that's weight off the rail. And so trying to minimize how much we're moving our bodies around. So we're going to set that sail trim control up for the lulls and just kind of let it ride for the puffs. Um, that's kind of what we were thinking there. With uh, crew weight, you know, obviously the boat gets wider right in the middle stanchion right here, just forward of the, the cabin top winches. And we wanted to center our weight there. And you can see that we're all really scrunched up and nice and chummy, definitely not COVID friendly. Um, but the more we can get our weight together and concentrated in that area, the widest part of the boat, you know, the more effective our hiking is gonna be. And uh, you know, proper hiking technique is something that we can talk about for a while. But it's you know, really important that you try to maximize every little ounce of your body, try to get it outboard as far as possible. You know, our, our boat owner doing the, the bow up here is not a prime example of proper hiking technique. <laughs> but, you know, we'll, we'll give him a little bit of slack since he does own the boat there. Taking a lot of the waves, too. <laughs> right. So, and, uh, you know, just a note on the mass boat, we did keep the mass boat in the same position as day two. You know, we wanted to keep the head stay nice and tight while also having a range with the back stay, some depth in the mainsail. So this proved to be a, a really good setting for day three. Nice. Yeah, you guys, the, in the photo, it looks real nice. I like the weight back, you know, with the waves and together hiking hard. It's, it's a good, good setup. All right. 
the age old question, <laughs> Genoa or Blade? Uh, it's a tough one. We kind of touched on it earlier with John. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, things to kind of run through your mind with your team, your setup, your boat, um, you know, how you feel in windy conditions, all kind of plays into uh, which you decide, you know, to go with for the day. And, and a lot of people end up looking around too at, at uh, what, they're, what the other boats are doing. That all comes into play too. It's a comfort thing. It's what everyone else is doing. It's thinking about the waves, sea state, uh, all that stuff, uh, the lulls. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure this is really a great question for Paul because he's, <laughs> he's a trimmer. I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, any boat I've ever, any J24 <laughs> I've ever sailed on ever got a choice on which sail we went with, but. Uh, well, you know, Will is the president of the Trimmers Association. <laughs> I, uh, I always give my tactician a number of tacks per day. Yep. And uh, he's an over under number, you know, so he can use them all up in the very beginning or he can use them up all day long. But that's, you know, trimmers, we all have to stick together. Uh, it's one, a, of the it's one tack beat. It, you know, you know, if he does it right, it's one tack, two tacks, yep. actually. You know, we got to tack off a of starboard, go around yep. the weather mark again. So two <laughs> tack beat. But uh, no, um, it is uh, it is the age old question. And I think. Um, as a trimmer and as a driver and as a, everything on a J24 is since I was a kid, uh, I love trimming the trimming the Genoa and Big Breeze. I think it's it's really what sets the the top teams apart from the others. And and so understanding uh, your team and your trimmer's ability is the is the very first question. If you can't tack the Genoa efficiently, uh, then that's one of the one of the things you have to consider. But um, I think Johnny hit a lot of the points in his, uh, in his talk about why we went with the Genoa on day, uh, day two. Um, first and foremost is how's the boat setting up? As, are, we, are we turning the main inside out? Is the main luffing too much? Um, you know, all those things go into play, uh, whether we're going to use the Genoa or the blade. Um, the quick story, Johnny and I were sailing uh, 2019 North Americans, and we were in the practice race didn't want to use the Genoa, didn't want to tear it up uh, because we knew the forecast for the weekend was light. So we put the blade up and Johnny, I don't know if you remember people were going by us kind of laughing at us a little bit because we were switching out. It was only blowing maybe 15, 16. And uh, uh, we put the blade up. And if I remember correctly, we dusted them pretty good off that uh, starting line and they never saw us again. So I think you can make the blade work if uh, the conditions are right. And one is if it's, uh, not too choppy, the water's a little flat, uh, you can go ahead and get into the blade a little sooner. But if you need that power and that punch, maybe that Genoa is the better call. So, uh, you know, when we do go heavier Genoa, we got to look at our lead position because we're going to be easing it out. If we left those leads back, uh, and we would probably be washing the main out as Johnny eases the main sheet. So I went lead forward pretty good bit about probably three quarters of an inch normal than what we would have been normal. And I was really easing the Genoa sheet in the puffs, um, which allowed us to stay into that, into that sail. Had the main been flogging a lot, probably would have been a better call to go with the blade. So um, those are the, those are the real big things that I look for in making that decision as a skipper when I'm driving, uh, not as a trimmer, as, as a trimmer, you know, uh, I want to do well. So I'm going to, you know, Honestly, I'm going to pick the sail that gets us around the race course the fastest. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it really does come down to comfort level. Uh, it comes down to uh, what the venue is. Is it flat water? Is it, uh, or it or is it really shifty? Um, is it uh, wavy with uh, not a lot of shifts? Um, you know, that all kind of plays into which sail you go with. And then I also think that when you're right on that edge. Uh, it's not as easy as just going one sail or the other. I think that if you're, if you're, if you're going to the blade in, you know, 16, 15, 14, um, then you probably should be a step, at least a step looser on the, on the shrouds, especially if it's a, a venue like Miami with waves. So sometimes you gotta, you know, with the blade power that sail up a little bit, uh, go a little lighter on the shrouds, maybe a little uh, hole or, uh, forward on the jib lead and uh, set that sail up so it's a little bit more powerful. And on the, on the flip side, if you're using the Genoa at the top end, you might be, you know, 
pulling the halyard a little extra hard. You might move the lead back one. Uh, you might uh, uh, go a step tighter on the shrouds. Um, you know, it's it, it's uh, those are things to think about uh, either direction. Yep. So, uh, anything to add there, uh, John? I mean, you you've obviously got a lot of time in the boat. Uh, well, many decisions uh, to be made between uh, Genoa and Blade. You got anything yeah. to add? Yeah, definitely. I I think you know you guys all hit on a lot of them. I, I mean, I think if it was a shiftier day and, and flatter water, I think it would have been a no brainer to go with the blade, but it was, you know, pretty steady, more of a drag race to get to the left side of the race course, really choppy. And like I said, we went up wind and, you know, sails weren't flogging. Genoa wasn't luffing, you know, a lot being eased out as much as we had it. And I think whenever I see my main flogging a lot or the Genoa, you know, just even eased out a lot, just, you know, the front of the sails luffing a lot and everything, that's a lot of drag. And, you know, we just didn't feel like there was a lot of drag there with the sails, you know, luffing, flogging. Um, and again, just looking at what other people are doing and it's always a hard choice, but, you know, flatter water, shiftier conditions, and you know, you're going to be tacking a lot, then I, I think we would have been in the blade in that yeah. same velocity. Cool, thank you. Uh, Nick, um, you wanna run through changing gears and uh, some of the steps there? Yeah, so, you know, Miami conditions, obviously we're talking about a lot of puffs and lulls and, you know, using blades, using genoas, a lot of variables going on. And, you know, it's really important to be able to go through these gear changes and steps to keep the boat powered up and sailing as fast as possible all the time. And so on our boat, you know, we use the word mode. What mode do we want to be in? And we're referring to like a height mode or a normal sailing mode where the boat's just nice and balanced and going well through the water. Or we'll talk about a fast mode. You know, oftentimes we found ourselves on the, the far left edge of the race course and we just wanted to kind of put the bow down, ease the sails out, really rumble over the grip to leeward of us. And so, you know, we would say, okay, time to be in a fast mode here. And, um, you know, I'd like to ask what Paul and Johnny were talking about in the back of the boat. You know, when Mike and I are saying we need to be in this mode or that mode, kind of what are the steps or what are the changes you guys are making in the back of the boat? Um, Paul? Well, I mean, I think it's uh, – I'm taking Johnny's lead because I'm listening to what the tacticians are saying and then Johnny's telling me what mode he wants to be in. And so, uh, for me, just Genoa trim, you know, whether we're going to be a little on the tight side to – stay up off of somebody or, or we're going to go fast forward and we're going to ease out. Uh, Johnny's got the control of the backstay and main sheet. And so he's going to put the boat in the mode that he wants it to be in. And it's him and I are just conversing back and forth about what that is and keeping the boat going full speed as a, as a trimmer, my job is to make sure the boat's always going full speed. And then Johnny gets to decide whether he wants to listen to the tactician or you know, go with me and go fast. And so, it's a battle in Johnny and I, we play it really well. Uh, I think a couple of times we get, you know, I get that sensation that the boat's stuck and I think we all do at times. And so it's, you know, ease the sails out, get the boat going again and then get that keel working. Cause as soon as that keel stalls, the boat goes sideways. So I think Johnny, Johnny does it best. I mean, he, he has a real good feel for it and he puts the boat in the mode that he wants. And if he has to climb, he's going to go high and slow for a little bit, but then we got to get the boat going. What do you think, John? Yeah, you know, I, I, it's important you have somebody on board who's helping you with the the sort of, um, you know, some of the you know, tacticians, the ultimate person who's going to tell you maybe what, what mode they want you in at times. But in general, you're just sailing the boat normal and, you know, normal VMG as a driver. And, and you need somebody on the rail to tell you how you're going relative to the boats around you. So, Paul's the guy on, on our boat, our trimmer. Every time I sail with anybody, I like to have the trimmer. They're right next to me. I can hear them. And they're telling me, you know, you're, you're, uh, you know, you're faster and higher or, you know, you're lower and slower or whatever it is. And, you know, I want to hear that info and I want to be able to make the adjustments as the helmsman. Um, you know, windy conditions. I think it's really nice having the pro start on the boat. I know most people have the pro start now, the Velocitech pro start. And I think sailing in those windy conditions our sort of normal upwind boat speed was somewhere and just use it as a reference, you know, um, 
I would say five, four to five, six was kind of your normal boat speed. And if you put the bow down and we would maybe ease out the Genoa, ease the main sheet, uh, lots of back stay on, put the bow down and go fast mode. If we wanted that, we were probably looking for more like, you know, five, eight to even six, two on the, on the speed over ground and the Velocitech. So I use that. It's great to have that now just to kind of have as sort of a, almost like a sanity check when you're going upwind and knowing what you're kind of looking for. Um, you know, obviously a lot of it's feel and a lot of it's working with your trimmer for what mode you're in. But I can tell you when it's windy, it's very easy to want to trim everything harder to try to point. And, you know, what I've found in these boats with a Genoa, you actually, if you ease out the Genoa, you'll actually, the bow will go up and you'll point better. So working well with your trimmer and um, having that one person on the rail telling you all the time how you're going. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really important. Cool. Good points there, John. All right, Nick. Uh, you know, obviously sailing in Miami, it's, uh, it's not an easy place to sail, right? So tell us a little bit about your upwind strategy for the week. Yeah, weekend. so so going into this event, you know, we, we're all pretty good buddies on board and we all get along really well. And uh, so our strategy going into the, the whole regatta as a whole, you know, obviously we wanted to try to do really well and come away with the win, but we weren't putting a lot of stress on trying to win the event, kind of, kind of keeping it fun, keeping things loose, keeping things cool. And, uh, you know, recognizing we had a saying on our boat is that top threes will win a regatta. Uh, you don't have to win every single race, but as long as you try to keep it in the top three, even top five at some events, you know, you're going to have a really good shot at being in the hunt come that last day, that last race. And that was our, our main goal. Um, you know, upwind strategy, I was working with Mike Marshall a lot, talking about what we're seeing upwind and kind of setting ourselves up for the long-term play. And, um, you know, Miami is one of those venues where the puffs don't really move across the, the water. You really have to go after the puffs. You have to kind of attack the race course and sail into the pressure before you make any decision on where you want to go and, and what you want to do with that pressure. Um, you know, and part of that is identifying what the long tack is. You know, by saying long tack, we're talking about what tack is the lift attack or what's the tack that's going to get you closest to your, your destination being the windward mark. And uh, so Mike and I were trying to identify what the long tack was, you know, well before our, our start. And then put ourselves on the starting line in a position where we can get to the long tack and maximize our time on that tack. You know, the left side of the race course was pretty favored in Miami out of that east southeast direction. You know, you really want to get top left and take advantage of the key, but it's a high risk scenario. If you try to win the pin, you're going to get stuck by boats above you and not be able to tack. And the next thing you know, you're, you're overstood and everyone else who's able to tack a little bit before lay line or on lane lane has you, uh, has you beat there. And so, you know, we recognize that and our strategy was start kind of more midline so that later up the leg, we have more options. Um, you know, and the last thing here, and I'm, and I'm sure Paul appreciates this, is minimizing your maneuvers. You know, in those choppy, puffy, kind of windy conditions, attack is pretty costly, especially if you're using the Genoa. You know, we figured one tack with Genoa, a good tack that is, you're probably losing anywhere between three or four boat lengths every single tack. And so, you know, we were really making sure that our tacks counted. If we wanted to make a tactical decision, or one, we were making sure that we were in the best pressure. We weren't leaving anything on the race course. And other, making sure that, you know, we're identifying what the long tack was so that when we do make that maneuver, it's going to stay and we're going to take advantage of being on that long tack and getting up the race course there. Um, Paul, John, you guys have anything to add about our, our upwind strategy here? I think I kind of covered it all. How about downwind sailing? Uh, John, why don't you kind of run, run through for me uh, and the rest of the folks? You know, what do you think the key is for, for downwind? Where, how do you set the crew weight up? What, what are the, uh, what's the communication between the crew front to back? Can you kind of run us through that, the, the important stuff? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, first big thing is, um, you know, you get around, you're on that offset leg, get around the windward mark is, is really, 
you know, I want to know from my tactician, am I gonna, am I gonna keep kind of a high exit or am I gonna, you know, do I have room to go low? Are we thinking about jibing early? Those are all things that we talk about as we, you know, get the pole on and get ready to, to think about our set on that offset leg. So I think that's number one, having that communication, knowing if somebody's right on your hip on the rounding, you know, we're gonna have to play defense. Um, and we're gonna have to sail high. Is it gonna be a high exit? So, you know, there were definitely some races where we jived early and we needed to know that right away. So we were free on the rounding at the offset leg to be able to jibe. And, you know, those kind of things I think is number one, just having that communication from the tactician and everybody knows what, what the plan is and what we're going to do. So, you know, that was number one. Um, and then after that, after we set, you know, I, we, we get settled in after the set, we're going downwind um you know there were a lot of weeds in the water we always would send our whitest person on the boat to the back of the boat to, to do a weed check um i could do it sometimes as a skipper but I, I don't know i i always feel like that's a little bit tough especially if it's windy so nick would go back he'd do a weed check right away once we were settled in downwind we had a weed stick he would do that and a lot of times there were weeds so doing that making sure that you know kind of checking off the boxes right away making sure we don't have any weeds on the rudder um, you know, crew weight, if it's, uh, if it's a windy day, like we had the last two days, you know, I, I think, um, you know, there certainly can be some, some changing with, uh, with your weight, you know, throughout the course of the leg. And we had some big puffs. We had probably had, you know, 18, 20 knot puffs on the high end and in the walls, we probably see in 10, 12 knots. So there was a lot of change in, you know, angle of heel weight position fore and aft. And I think, um, you know, number one, our trimmer, Paul, you know, myself as a driver, we basically stay in the st same spots pretty much all the time. So we're not really moving. You know, you can see Paul standing up there out to windward. He's kind of in that position all the time. And then I'm always to lured. I like to have the main sheet purchase in my arm and I can play the main. Um, and I'm always to lured. So nothing's really going to change no matter what the breeze does really between the two of us. So it's really the other three guys up front. And so um mike marshall our tactician when it was windy he would take the guy he'd sit in the companion way he would kind of brace one foot across you know um you know facing outboard and he could grab the guy have some leverage and he could play the guy for paul if paul couldn't you know handle both the sheet and the guy when it was windy um and then he also you know if it's light he can move around as much as he wants he can go down below if uh, you know if it's light and there's a, a bunch of chop coming and get his weight low but in general he's in the companion way that's kind of where we have our tactician standing in the companion way um our bow guy is able to you know i think go side to side as needed um and then our twin guy who was nick and doing the compass and calling puffs and everything like that you know kind of the same deal they both have the ability to sort of move you know, around a little bit more and be more agile. And, you know, one thing I kept saying to them when it was windy was let's keep the weight outboard out to the sides and let's keep the boat flat so that we are able to drive, you know, down in the waves in the puffs and not have the boat weather heel at all. I start losing the rudder and you risk maybe wiping out or the boat just rocking back and forth too much. So keeping the boat flat. And then if it's really, really windy, I don't know if we ever got to this point, but maybe both my, you know, bow and, and uh, you know, mass person might both go to the leeward side of the boat to keep the boat flat. I'm not sure if we did that at all, Nick, maybe, maybe a couple times in some puffs, but you know, it wasn't quite that windy. That's like full plane conditions, but you stack the rail, the leeward, but keeping the boat flat. I want the rudder in the water. I want to be able to drive it. I want to be able to carve down in the puffs. And, you know, they, the whole team did a really good job just keeping the boat flat. And then if we, had a little bit less pressure, could weather heel more. And I love to sail with weather heel downwind. If I have the pole back in the boat and we're sailing, you know, dead downwind, you know, or so, um, weather heel is, you know, to me is, it, I think is can just be deadly downwind. And so we did a lot of that on the first day when it was light and we could go back on the pole and the puffs or even the second and third days when it was windy, but there were lulls. We would soak down and, you know, we could weather heel a little bit. Hey, Will. I, got a, I got a question for you, John. Any any tricks? You know, sometimes the you know when it gets windy with the J twenty four, the hull shape of the boat, um, you know, it, it can be a little tough downwind, right? So, any any tricks you do? Like, do you do you, do you play the vang? Do you um, you know pull the the twings down? Uh, anything like that to kind of help 
uh, keep the boat under control? Yeah, I, you know, I don't think we ever had that much wind where we had a, we were never really planning, maybe in some waves, we would, you know, the boat would unload and we'd get, get moving, but it was never, never down. I don't think I remember anybody really wiping out downwind. It wasn't that windy, but yeah, if it got that windy, you know, I think a few things, yeah, you could bring both twings down some, you know, especially on the jibe. I think both twings could go down and Paul might be able to talk to that a little bit more as the trimmer. Um, certainly the stacking, the lured rail, I think is a, is a huge, is a huge, uh, you know, weapon in the breeze down when you don't see a lot of people not doing that. And then the boat is too weather healed um, and just out of control. And you get your bow guy and your, your mass guy to lured under the boom. And then you're able to keep the boat flat and just have more steerage and your rudders in the water. And that's going to be really fast. And then Vang. Yeah. When it's windy, you got to get the Vang on. And I never, I can tell you, Nick was doing the Vang. I never had to say to him once like Vang on Vang ease. He was all over it and made sure the Vang was trimmed perfectly all the time. Uh, but the windier it gets and the lower you're sailing, then the more Vang you need, you know, to keep the boat just in control. And, um, you know, get a little bit, you know, pull that vang on, get a little bit more twist at the, you know, or, or close off the top of the main a little bit more. So it's not so twisty and the boat's out of control. So, you know, he did a great job with that. Um, you know, I think if it's also really windy, a little bit of backstay, you can keep on, you know, you don't have to have it off all the way, a little bit of backstay and maybe sail bow up a little bit if you feel out of control, right? Don't sail dead down wind, you know, maybe broad reach and put the bow up a little bit put the pole forward a little bit in those big puffs, just a little bit bow up and the boat will be ripping and more in control than if you're trying to sail dead down winter by the lee. Yeah. Hey, Will, Thank I want you. to touch on the communication part of things. Um, yeah, real quick. Yeah. As a trimmer, as, as we come around the weather mark, the tactician has the command of the boat and where we need to be based upon other boats. And there were times down the legs where uh, Mike would say, all right, Paul, you're, it's your boat. And when I hear that, I know it's, I'm all about communication with the driver then and letting Johnny know how deep we can sail. Uh, and especially that first day when the winds were a little bit lighter and we're going to try to push the boat down and go as deep as we can. But as soon as it gets light, we got to get the bow back up. And so I had a lot of communication with Johnny about driving the boat up in the lighter, lighter air to keep the boat uh, moving fast. And then all of a sudden we get into a, you know, tactical role and Mike would say, all right, I got the boat and Johnny would listen to Mike. And so being able to pass that communication off, and knowing when it's your time to uh, to take the lead, uh, I think those team that teamwork has to work together. So, yeah, no, it's good stuff. It's all about communication, right? Yeah. All right. Hey, Nick, uh, tell us a little bit, real quick, about your downwind strategy. Yeah. So the downwind strategy is pretty straightforward. You know, um, talking about and kind of building on the crew role communication standpoint there. You know, Mike being our primary tactician, he's kind of thinking long-term play. He's thinking about, you know, what are we going to do when we get down to the gate marks? You know, what side of the, the run do we need to protect? He's looking at traffic. He's looking at our competition. And, you know, that kind of leaves a gap for the short-term stuff, the puffs and the lulls. And you know, so that's kind of where I stepped in and I was calling localized pressure and making sure that we were always staying in the puffs. You know, at times we found ourselves heading up, you know, 10 degrees or more to try to attack a puff and get into it just a little bit more pressure. Um, you know, and obviously the primary tactician, Mike in that case, can overrule that for tactical reasons and positioning. But I'm mainly talking to Paul, you know, and I'm making sure that Paul knows what's coming. And, you know, I'm talking to Johnny as well. If I see something big, like a big puff to windward or to leeward, you know, say, hey, we come up 10 here, we can attack this puff and be in a little bit more pressure. So I, I think that's really important to have one person assigned in that role, calling the localized pressure and making sure that you're staying in as much pressure as possible. You know, our, our downwind strategy, the downwind legs are pretty straightforward, you know, not a whole lot of jibing, um, not a whole lot of shifts going downwind, but we re really wanted to set ourselves up for the gate rounding so that we could pick the correct gate and by that, I mean, we wanted to round the gate and be on the long tack immediately so that we're getting up the course right away. So rounding the gate mark that was going to put us on the lifted tack immediately. And uh, so, you know, Mike and I would have that conversation about halfway down the leg, oh, which gate do we want to go to? And, uh, you know, oftentimes our decision was 
making sure that we could be on the lift attack and get up the race course, thinking that our competition rounding the other gate is not sailing a direct course to the winter mark. So we're gaining a little bit of boat lengths there, a little bit of distance. And you know, then once we are going up wind, like our upwind strategy was to find the best pressure of these big breeze lines coming down the race course, we can make a decision on when we wanted to cross the course and made it a lot easier for us. You know, we just kind of wanted to be on our own, sailing our boat as fast as possible and not letting other boats kind of dictate where we wanted to go and what we wanted to do. All right, good stuff, good stuff. Well, I have just, just two little things. So one, that photo that you just had up there of us going downwind, you can see, I was talking about the windward heel downwind. You can see we have a little bit more weather heel than any of the other boats around us. It's not super windy right here, but typically sailing with more weather heel than, than I think you think, and it's fast. And it's, you might not be faster through the water than say what bow 57 is doing, but you definitely can sail lower. And I think that's the big, the big key. Um, and then the other thing with just the gate, the gate selection, one thing we, we really try to do and Nick hit on it was, you know, we like to be free downwind. And so we can sail the boat the way we want. Same kind of deal when we're choosing lured gates and less like the gates are really skewed or something. Um, you know, the path of least resistance is always nice. And I think that was one thing we did a lot. There were times where we might've been in third or fourth going downwind, but we would be first to one of the gates and three other boats went to the other gate and that were ahead of us. So that, that path of least resistance is always something to always consider and then getting on the long tack right away after the rounding. Good stuff, good stuff. All right, I, um, I think a bunch of questions have come through. I'm gonna let Nick handle that. But before I do, um, I was talking with Chip Till and uh, a little earlier, and uh, he, he wanted me to ask you guys what you thought of the, uh, the marks. I'll let you take that, uh, John. Yeah, I, you know, first, is Chip on here? I, I thought I maybe saw I'm not him. sure if he is or not, I can't see, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I, obviously that those marks, the you know, the the robotic marks have been uh, yeah. a big reason why regattas and sailing has been able to, you know, sailboat racing's uh, been able to happen this year. So, I think as a PRO, he was interested in, you know, what did you guys on your boat think about, you know, racing yeah. a regatta with them? How they yeah. work? Any pluses or minuses? Yeah, I think. Um, well, Those first. Are, uh, a shout out to Chip and his his team. They did an awesome job uh, running races, and you know I think the practice race day on Thursday they they had a couple little hiccups with the marks, but they obviously got that all sorted out by the regatta, and they did a great job. Um, I, I've done a few regattas this winter down in Florida and did some J seventy stuff, and they used the the same thing, the mark set bots, and I don't know. I I'm sold on them. I think they're great. I, I haven't seen any you know any issues. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the race committee work was was really, really great um, at the midwinters. So I, I nothing, nothing on my end. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm here. This is Chip. If there's hey, any Chip. questions. I would say, Chip, the only complaint I would have is that you didn't give us enough time between races to uh, <laughs> relax for a little bit. Well, Johnny, maybe you should sail faster. Yeah, hey, I, need to get better, I need to get in better shape, you know. <laughs> Chip, Chip, how did you like? How did you like the marks as a PRO? Were they easy to deal with? Yeah. So if I could just comment on that real quick, um, I, I I thought that uh, the Mark Set Bot team did a really good job of um, of you know getting them all prepped up, and that's really the biggest piece of it. Uh, Will is getting sorted and and out to the race course, and yeah, we did have a little hiccup just one time. Um, but the good thing is, is there's still a, a mark. And so we just throw a traditional anchor on the mark set bot and we anchor it. Um, it happened to be the right gate looking upwind on Friday. And uh, we just pivot. If we have to change the wraith course, we just pivot the left gate uh, to square the square the, uh, the gates up. So um, I, I think they're great. Um, and I've, I've been very uh, vocal with the mark set bot people that I think Really, the hurdle that uh, and the challenge that we have right now is the the, the finance and the cost. Um, but I'm like anything; I'm sure that cost will come down over time. But they were they were super great this weekend. I had no issues. Um, 
using them and I, I i think the and i hope the competitors enjoyed them um so that that was my experience nice thank you chip um nick how are we looking in the questions box you want to run through a few of them yeah so we got a few questions and uh, you know we're not going to be able to get to everyone's questions just because we're running out of time um and, and we'll touch base on that in a little bit but a couple ones that are, are highlighted here um you know bob kinsman um it, you know the boom van going up wind is a very powerful tool and um you know, in the puffs, you see a big puff coming or cruise counting down a puff in a, you know, yes, effectively getting, you know, two people, the two man it to get enough tension on so that the bottom of the mainsail gets flat enough and really relieves some helm is, uh, is critical. Um, another one here from Oscar is uh, talking about top end of the Genoa, big breeze and uh, you know, seeing a little bit of the front end of the Genoa luffing is perfectly fine, you know, just enough to get you through the puff, you know, easing the Genoa to kind of keep the boat at a happy heel angle. The front of the Genoa is going to luff a little bit, but once that puff goes away, you can trim the Genoa right back in and, and off you go. Um, and one more question here, and then we'll kind of call it a night, is pumping. And, um, you know, maybe Paul, you can kind of touch base on this, but, you know, going downwind, how aggressive were you pumping and kind of what was your technique or what were you looking for? Yeah, so uh, first it's, uh, you know, can, can you pump and get the boat going faster down the wave? And that's the first thing. So you have to get the boat on the proper angle. I know a few days one job was better than the other. And then the other thing I'm always watching for is if we're pulls all the way back, uh, if you if the pulls all the way back and your you know, kite's fully eased, if you pump and all you do is pull the sail around the head stay, that's not very good. So, you know, with the J24, we're allowed to pump on the guy or sheet. So if I'm really sailing deep, I may pump the guy and give it a good pull uh, and, and not touch the sheet. But if I'm maybe broad reaching a little bit more, it's windier, the pull's forward, I'm gonna you know, probably pump the sheet as hard as I can to get the boat going. And then it's a matter of easing the sheet and getting the boat going down the wave uh, as Johnny and I you know, work together. And then it's just set back up and do it again on the next wave. And I think we were real successful on Sunday pumping uh, there was a better wave set and wind speed wise for that. So nice. if we did, if we didn't get to everyone's question, um, you know, please feel free to reach out to any of the North Sales J24 class experts. You'll know, be more than happy to uh, personally have a chat with you about the J24. You know, so we really like talking about the boat. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, like like Nick said, if um, if there are any other questions that come up after this or we missed anything, email us, call us. We always like chatting about J twenty fours. And uh, just wanted to you know give a congratulations uh, to everyone that sailed the event. And uh, we're we're looking forward to seeing everyone else at the next one. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Have a have a great night. Thanks for joining. Thanks, guys.